He kōna e purangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. This series contains references to death and trauma associated with the Canterbury earthquakes and may be upsetting to some listeners. Yeah, I'd just parked my car in a sixth floor of Blitchfield car park and I'd made my way down at Cashel Mall and I'd just gone into the Trocadero Bakery. That's Blair grabbing lunch on February the 22nd, 2011. It's his wife's 50th birthday, but soon to be remembered as a different kind of anniversary. Got served by two young girls in the bakery. I walked out, I went to the left-hand side of the mall, and I was sitting there enjoying my uh, cottage pie when the earthquake hit. So I jumped up and went to the middle of the mall, and at that stage, the real what I call the second phase of the earthquake hit. Everything just started collapsing. There's some guy, I don't know who he was, but he grabbed me and says, we've got to get out of here. And I said, no, there may be people that need help. And I turned around, and probably within 10 metres of me was a lady who had a big parapet completely over her. I knew she was, no way she could have survived that. But I ran over, and that's when I saw the little baby arm sticking up from underneath her. And uh, I said something, and a guy said, what's that? And I said, there's a baby under her. And I remember him freezing. There's a group of guys from Fletcher's working about 30 metres up the road near the bog bar, and they come over to help. They had a lot, and they took off, and they got a large beam. So we managed to put it on top of a rock and jimmy it up and pull the mum out from under the big parapet. Someone must have taken the baby and took off with the baby. So I never ever saw that baby again. Well, I was in the press building in the city centre when the earthquake hit. It's right in the central city. And I was actually on the phone talking to a policeman, just doing my daily round calls. Olivia Carville, a junior reporter at Christchurch's main newspaper. All of a sudden the phone was just cut, the line just cut and then I was I kind of like looked at it and then I realised the building was moving and then the siren started and then I just heard this almighty crash and everyone started screaming. So I got under my desk and I remember holding my head and when the earthquake was it was so violent that it was actually going up and down and I was lifted off the ground underneath my desk, which was a really weird experience. And I looked over and I saw one of my colleagues and he just said, the building's going down, we're going down. And that's when I thought, shit, we actually are going down. I'm Katie Gossett and this is Fragments, first-hand accounts of the February 2011 earthquake, the 6.3 magnitude quake that struck Christchurch at 12.51 on an overcast summer's afternoon 10 years ago, killing 185 people. These are eyewitness stories recorded just a few months after the earthquake that, when pieced together, complete the biggest story of a broken city. Then I thought, this is pretty bad. I could die in here. As I was getting into the middle of the square, the cathedral fell down in front of me, and it sort of started hitting me. I thought, this is really bad. And I just thought, what the hell has happened to my city? Episode 3, The Cathedral and CBD. Well, I guess I should probably start out by talking about the little room that I had at the cathedral. A lot of people who went to the cathedral didn't even know that it existed. Sue Spiegel is an artist, a quilter who works from a space at the top of the cathedral. Each day she climbs up a tiny circular stairway. And on days when I wore my puffy black coat, I would have white patches on both of my shoulders because it was so narrow walking up and it was 22 steps up from the ground floor. 
The Christchurch Cathedral is one of the most instantly recognisable buildings in New Zealand. Right at the heart of the city, it's an Anglican church, stone, Gothic, built in the late 19th century, with a 63 metre high spire and a rose window. And I was in the middle of the city, but yet I was by myself, and so I could do my work. And there was a little window seat where I would sit and drink my coffee and just watch people in the square walk by. Beautiful little place. She's been working in this room on and off for the last two and a half years, but it's a bit remote from the rest of the cathedral. And as I looked out the window, I often thought, if I ever have to get out of this room, it's going to be through that window. Since the first big Canterbury earthquake on September the 4th, Sue's felt quite a few aftershocks in this wee room, and actually she hasn't been here for a while because of the quakes. But by the morning of Tuesday, February the 22nd, things feel like they've settled down, so she goes to work in her little room for the first time in about a week. She's got a project she really needs to get on to. I was making a, a cope for the Dean of Auckland, which was very intricate, I had finally finished it and pressed them and they were lying there on the ironing board and they were beautiful. I was really pleased with with my work. I work in a police inquest office and we're in um, NZI House and we're on the third floor. Police officer Paul Martin. You met his wife Megan in the last episode as she helped collect the names of people trapped inside the PGC building. On September, when that earthquake hit, ever since then our building was shaky, so we'd be working at our desk on a computer and when someone walked past, the computer would shake and you'd think it was an earthquake. And, um, and that sort of had everyone on edge in our office from September. I had a few things on my mind following on from previous earthquakes. Also nearby is Robin McCarthy, a tour operator. Decided to go into the square and take some brochures round to one of our sellers and got into the square, couldn't find a park. There was nothing on the tour coach stand. So he decides to drive around the block. It's about 10 to 1. Sue Spiegel is ready for some lunch, but she normally listens to World Watch on RNZ at that time, so she decides to wait. But I got up and I walked across the room and sat down in my little window seat and opened the window and just as I sat down the room started to shake and I thought oh, that was a big one. Got up adjacent to the Stock Exchange building where the Regent Theatre is. Robin McCarthy. And suddenly my car dropped what appeared or felt like half a metre to the right. I became very aware quickly that this was a major earthquake taking place. But then it just kept going on and on and on. And I looked up and the roof of the room that I was in started to bounce around on top of the room. It's almost as if it had completely lifted off and it was just bouncing around on the walls and then boards from the ceiling began to fall down and the nails were in them where they had been nailed and started falling on me and I got these holes in my body and my back everywhere I was just covered with holes and bruises but I couldn't feel a thing. At that point absolutely everything was moving. The buildings in front of me, my car, the trams were moving. The overhead wires for the trams were gyrating wildly. And then I thought, this is pretty bad. I could die in here and I should try and get under the desk. And one of the desks wasn't more than a meter from where I was. And so I tried to get down on my hands and knees to crawl over to get under the desk, but I couldn't because the, the room was shaking so badly. In the nearby NZI building, Paul Martin is on the phone. He can tell it's a bad quake. 
you think, is it going to go on? Is it going to get worse? And then it started getting worse and everyone got under their desks, including me. It felt like it took forever and it felt like our building was actually going to collapse. In Cathedral Square, Robin McCarthy is still in his car. He puts his foot down, grabs the park that's actually a tour bus stand and thinks about what to do. He's got two options. But those options weren't great at the time. I was very concerned I was going to be squashed or electrocuted by the overhead wires uh, which power the tram and they are around about 600 volts DC. I decided that I'd choose the electrocution option because I thought it'd be quick. He jumps out of the car. I could hear buildings collapsing behind me. There was an enormous amount of noise. There was ongoing mayhem in terms of the way everything was vibrating. And 22 steps up a narrow stairway in a tiny room, Sue Spiegel can also feel those vibrations. I just sat down and I held on to the window and within a few seconds, a huge piece of masonry fell through the roof of my room. So there's this gaping hole and this huge piece of masonry and it landed on the two desks that were together then I felt the floor give way. The, the desks were, had totally collapsed and broken, and the floor, I could feel the floor giving way under my feet. And I realized that if I had been under that desk, I would have been under that piece of masonry, and that would have been it. And then all at once, everything went black when I guess the rest of the tower fell and things crumbled. There was this huge rush of wind, which was like a tornado going through. And I tried to open my mouth to say something and I had to close it because it just filled up with all this dust and dirt. And I thought, I really don't want to die right now. And I really want to see my grandson grow up. I wasn't scared. I wasn't afraid of dying, but I just really wasn't ready to to go. I still had too much that I wanted to do and see. An enormous amount of dust appeared. I could hear buildings or things falling off buildings all around me. Robin rushes to get away from them. He runs into the centre of Cathedral Square, and as he does... The cathedral fell down in front of me, and then the shaking stopped. Thousands of people poured into the square. Once it settled, we all got up, and we're quite a close-knit group, so we all checked on each other. Paul Martin at the NZI building. He's about to head to the square himself, but first he tends to a colleague who's hurt her ribs while falling. Once that's done, he checks everyone's off their floor. And when he makes it down to Hereford Street himself, his first thought is that the damage isn't that bad. But he can see broken windows on the ANZ and BNZ buildings and thinks the police priority might be to stop people going in and taking money. And once we got down to there, it became a little bit more obvious that it was a terrible thing that had happened. And um, someone came up to me and said that the cathedral had collapsed and there were people in there. It was surreal. Robin McCarthy. I stood there and I looked around and it resembled a movie set because within a matter of seconds, probably 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, many people had arrived in the square, they are all covered in dust. And a lot of the people had head injuries. And of course, head injuries are always uh, conducive to bleeding quite badly. And a lot of blood had streaked down their clothing. A lot of them were directed to the police kiosk and they were uh, sat down and leant up against the wall of the police kiosk. And I went over to the cathedral and uh, the beat kiosk is very close. Paul Martin. And it was open. And at that stage, everyone was running around not really knowing what to do or where to go. And so I went into the beat kiosk and grabbed someone's hat and jacket so I was more visible to the public. Came back out and it was at that point that I saw um, that 
there was a lady up in the cathedral. Finally, the air cleared enough that I could start to see, and I looked out and I could see the staff from the cathedral had come out around behind the cathedral and were out and standing there looking at the tower, which had collapsed. And everybody was stunned and just stood there with their mouths hanging open. And I was inside and I was stunned and I was looking at them. So I decided it was time to let them know that I was there. And I stood up and I waved my hand and I said, hello, can anybody please help get me out of here? Across the square, just behind the cathedral itself, Olivia Carvel has crawled out from under her desk in the press building. Through all the dust and debris, I could see that the entire corner of the newsroom had fallen. And I didn't really know how bad it was. I didn't know how many people had been affected or anything like that. So that was really scary. And then after I crawled out from under my desk, the chief, well, the chief reporter now, he got hit in the head with a piece of rubble and his head was bleeding. And then there were people saying, no one move, don't run for the stairs, the building could go. So we're probably not stuck, but told not to move for about 15 to 20 minutes after the earthquake. And then that's when the dust kind of settled. The sirens were still going, but that's when we knew that this was a hell of a lot bigger than September. Soon she and her colleagues are racing for the stairs, actually jumping over bits of building that have come down. Everyone was you know, go, 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 like kind of go as fast as you can because they didn't know if another aftershock was going to hit and the whole stairway was going to collapse. Um, we did lose a colleague in, in the um, earthquake, which is really hard and been quite tough for a lot of the people at work. And she was in that top corner, which did fall. And there were quite a few people who were seriously injured up there. Um, and then once we were out on the street, the only way I can describe it is that it was like fleeing from a shattered building. And I ran out with my hands over my head because I thought bits of the building may come down and land on me. When she can finally stop, she takes a look around. You were just faced with a broken city. There were growing men crying. There were injured people screaming with blood and torn clothing. No one knew where they were going, no one knew what they were doing. It was madness. And I remember standing there and we were all just all just standing there, just staring at the press building and just thinking, holy shit, I can't believe I just got out of there alive. The uh, February earthquake event was significant from our perspective because we had an international urology meeting which was occurring in Christchurch. This is Stephen Mark, himself a local urologist and one of the organisers of the event. It was a big conference at the conference centre and at the town hall. On Tuesday the 22nd, Stephen has ducked back to work at Christchurch Public Hospital in the lunch break. At 12.51, he's heading back to the conference via the art centre, talking on his cell phone. When the earthquake happened, there was noise on the end of the cell phone, along with quite a lot of creaking and cracking noise from the art centre itself. Uh, because of the stone uh, facade, and there was a number of boulders that were coming off the building onto the footpath. So it was quite a sizeable shake, and you couldn't physically uh, stand up in a straight line. Stephen checks on buildings in the art centre to make sure people working there have got out OK. And then his focus shifts to the conference and his concern for his international guests. Probably my most significant emotion at that stage was more being upset that this had disrupted what we had organised as a, a major international group. There were people here who'd come in from uh, overseas and this was not a good way for our city to behave in such a time. About a block away, the timing's also not great for police officer Jason Mitchell. He's below ground level in the police cells under the Christchurch District Court building on Durham Street with a group of prisoners under his care. Jason's been in the police 23 years, eight of them working here in this old building. In previous quakes you'd hardly feel a bump, but this one is different. 
I'd already planned my escape route, which was to run out to a sally port, which I know the main body of the building is not on. And I thought if the building's going to collapse, the only hope of survival was to run down a corridor and uh, cross my fingers. At this point, I, I thought, right, we better do a, a recce on the prisoners. Jason's job is to bring prisoners from Paparoa prison to the court building for their fixtures and trials. He also collects people from the police station cells for bail hearings. Any day of the week, there might be up to 50 prisoners in these cells. But today, they get a bit lucky. We were only holding six prisoners at the time. Three mainstream males, which are in one cell, a female, um, a segregated male prisoner. And we'd had a youth who was about 16 years old, and he'd been remanded in custody or stood down in custody by the judge in the youth court for over the lunch break to teach him a lesson because he was mouthing off at the judge. And uh, needless to say, that was a really good lesson because these guys are trapped in a small concrete box um, where some had it steel doors with only eye holes that big to let in the light to look out of. Jason makes his way around all the prisoners to check they're OK. Some of them were screaming. They were paranoid because they were trapped. And I told them to calm down. All the power had gone and they were in darkness apart from light shining on their face. And like if they stood back, you couldn't see them. It's only when they came to the light, you could see them. And I could see that they were as white as ghosts. And a recce by a colleague shows the underground cells face another threat. The basement had started filling up with water. And because we're below the river level and with the cracks in the floor and the liquefaction, I thought, oh my God, we're going to drown. So um, that was one of the reasons why we just had to get out of there and... When the second shake come through, I just thought, no, we're getting out of here. But the steel roller doors that stand between them and the outside have failed in the earthquake. The only other way out was to go up the emergency stairwell and weave my way through the court and get them out. I'd find an exit. And there's another problem. Normally there are eight staff on in the cells, but just before the quake, six of them went to lunch. It's down to Jason and just one other colleague. Normal evacuation is to place them in a vehicle and drive them out, which would now wasn't an option. So I I couldn't just let them walk out because these are some of Christchurch's finest criminals and they would run away. I have no doubt. And I couldn't physically stop six. So I found a bunch of handcuffs and we handcuffed them together in an Indian file. And um, we went up a couple of flights of stairs through um, another area that I knew. I've got a master key to all doors. Went, went through some doors and got out into the foyer and walked outside and uh, saw the devastation across the road from the court. The church had come down and I knew that there were people in there. And it sort of started hitting me. I thought, this is really bad. On the edge of Cathedral Square, staff from the press are still coming to terms with what's happened to their building. And everyone was just in shock. No one was really talking, they were just staring at it. And then the videographer from work, Daniel Tobin, who I work with quite closely, he came round and he had his camera and he was like, are you okay? And I was like, no. And he's like, can you do work? Yep. (laughs) So he pulled the camera up and started walking backwards and he was just going, walk to me, Liv, talk to me, Liv, tell me what's going on. And I've been crying, so I was like, hey, don't cry, don't cry on camera. So we walked around stupidly around the side of the um, the cathedral and the cathedral was badly damaged as well there were just huge chunks of it on the floor and I was stepping over the chunks of it walking to him trying to tell him what had just happened so I've re-watched the footage and it's really I, I find it really strange watching it I don't really like to watch it I don't really recognize myself I just must have been in a severe state of shock I guess and my words wouldn't come out, and I was rushing, and yeah, it, it brings it all back. Then they make their way to the front of the cathedral. And Dan just said, the spire's down, the spire's down. And there were just hundreds of people gathered around the church just staring at it, just thinking, oh my God, I can't believe this has happened, I can't believe this has happened here. So I continued down towards the cathedral and the square because, again, there were people saying there were people injured down there and I thought I'd go past there uh, on the way to uh, getting back to the conference centre. Urologist Stephen Mark. 
looking down towards Worcester Street and it was obvious that the cathedral had come down and going into the square there was uh, people uh, on the footpath uh, as well as by the uh, police kiosk who had had some injuries but essentially were like a walking uh, wounded uh, lacerations to the head. A couple of streets away, Jason Mitchell is also on the move. He's now out of the court building with his six handcuffed prisoners in tow. Still, he's got a dilemma on his hands. Some of the prisoners have been dealt with by the court already. But what does he do with the ones who haven't? I grabbed a judge who was walking by and I ran a court session on the side of the bank. There were prisoners who I knew had to go back to the prison because they were bad. And so I asked the judge if we could remand them in custody back out to the prison and he did that and then there was two people who were applying for bail and one I didn't oppose on the conditions that he didn't re-offend in the next month and he abided by any bail conditions and I made up some bail conditions and of course he agreed to them he was going to sign anything he would have signed his house over to me at that stage and um, I had one scrap bit of paper with me and so I wrote out bail bonds on the scrap bit of paper and I got the judge to sign it and I got the defendant to sign it and they were free to go and they ran off into the wilderness and as far as I know they haven't re-offended. So we were filming around the square and then we were told to go to Cashel Mall because Cashel Mall was devastated in the quake. Olivia Carville and Daniel Tobin are still covering the story. As they walk towards Cashel Mall, people are huddling together in groups, hugging each other, trying to get hold of their loved ones, but the phones aren't working and they want information. And I had no idea. I had <laughs> no idea what to tell people or anything and that was, that was really tough. And then we went down Cashel Mall got some really graphic footage of um, people in the rubble who were clearly dead because of the angles that their body were at and you you know sometimes you could just see their feet with you know just sneakers on or that kind of thing and we were yelling in shops like whip calls you know hello is anyone in there did everyone get out is there anyone injured but no one was yelling back It was just chaos, really. Everyone running around. Blair is still in Cashel Mall, trying to help. Someone said there was people stuck in the bakery. They went into the bakery. I went into the this place next door. It's a clothing store. There was a lady in there with her husband. We managed to get him out. But I couldn't understand why we were trying to put a tourniquet on him, why his blood was so thin. And uh, but he had badly busted legs, and uh, I remember they put his leg up on a, a rock. And I thought, geez, that was bloody terrible. So I got a little piece of board and put that under his legs, and I remember the woman thanking me for it. And then we got down to um, to the centre of Cashel Mall. Olivia Carville. And I saw a woman with blood just all over her face with horrific facial injuries and she was making kind of inhuman groaning noises and I kind of like looked at her and I was like okay we need to get her to hospital and I heard her say Libby and that's that's my name so I turned around and I realized that she was a really close family friend of mine and I hadn't recognized her because her nose was to put it graphically, hanging off her face, and she just, I couldn't tell it was her. So I sat down next to her, and she told me that she thought her pelvis was broken, and she asked me to try and hold her together. So I sat behind her, and I tried to to support her so she could breathe properly, but I could hear from her breathing that there was blood in her lungs, and um, I knew that she wasn't, she was not in a good state, so I didn't quite know whether I should go and find help or whether I should stay with her and support her. Um, and then Dan came back with the camera, and I think he didn't know that she was a close friend. So I just said, you know, get the camera off her. I, I, I'm not, I'm not working anymore. 
At this stage, they're right by the Trocadero Bakery. That's where pastry chef Shane Tomlin works. Shane Tomlin, whose face went around the world as the face of the earthquake, who the baker, who got pulled out of the bakery alive and then passed away and no one knew where he was for a few days. He got pulled out and he was sitting on the bench right beside Jane and I and he was making that same inhuman groaning noise. It, it's a horrific noise and you can just tell that there's something seriously wrong. And then Jane lost consciousness and a policewoman came in a car and they had to choose between taking Jane or Shane to hospital. I just pulled Shane Tomlin out of the bakery. Blair is still helping near the Trocadero. And then I'm not sure where the lady, I think her name was Jane, and there was a girl helping her. So I thought I would try and help where else I was needed. Then a lady started screaming. She reckoned her friend was under this collapsed building. And uh, so myself and a couple of other guys were scaling around it. That's when the big aftershock hit. We took off like a bunch of... Uh, you know, self-preservation, I suppose. A, a policeman come along and uh, he, he quickly said, hey, if she's under that, there's not really much hope for her. We just hope she got out the back of the shop. He heads back towards Shane and Jane and wonders if something warm is needed to prevent them going into shock. So there was a clothing shop, which would have been on the left-hand side of the mall, heading towards Bridge, Bridge and Remembrance. I went in there and uh, I ripped their dressing room curtains off and I took them out for Shane Tomlin and the guy that had the badly busted legs and probably after about 15 minutes Jane's husband come along and he was comforting her sitting behind her. I heard the lady who we got her husband out of the shop screaming, found out later on he had died. I don't know if he'd bled to death or it was just, you know, compound injuries. So uh, that really upset me because she was so um, encouraging to her husband, saying how brave he was and how proud and uh, the sort of thing she was. Olivia Carville is still sitting with her friend Jane. Shane Tomlin is nearby. A police car is available to take one patient to hospital. And at that point, Shane was still making these noises, but Jane was unconscious. So, it, I mean, you know, they rock in a hard place, really. But they got Jane there and flew her straight to Wellington Hospital. Her husband was told that night to not hold out much hope. He didn't think she was going to survive the night. She'd broken every single bone inside her body. And a couple of, well, a couple of months later, when I spoke to her about it, she remembers everything, everything really really graphically and she remembered a bit of building coming down and she explained it as being squashed like a staple like she was folded in half and she had all her rib cage broken one of her lungs punctured her pelvis broken her neck fractured her skull fracture just serious injuries but Shane Tomlin is still in Cashel Mall and Blair becomes concerned that emergency services can't easily get to them I was just thinking, this is crazy. And I said to the people, listen, they can't get out. We need to get these people out to them. So that's when I looked round, I found a piece of white hoarding and uh, we put Shane Tomlin onto it. There were six of us and we carried him out to the Bridge Remembrance and there was a Navy station wagon. It must have been a police vehicle because they had a grilled door in the back of it and we couldn't slide him into it. So... They ended up putting them on the roof and uh, taking them away. Um, so we, we all know what happened after that. But I went back into the mall and uh, to look after Jane. By that time, she she had gone. Uh, my wife said she's seen those some videos. Oh, I've seen them. She said I was kicking rocks, looking real angry. I said, no, I was trying to kick them so we could get the police car in to get Jane out. <laughs> But uh, she got taken out in a police car. Back in Cathedral Square, Sue Spiegel is also injured. She was half out the window and she was bleeding from her head and there was a lot of people immediately under her um, 
that were trying to talk to her and, and calm her down. Police officer Paul Martin. My immediate concern was to her. I went over, I got everyone back because my main fear was that there was going to be another earthquake and it was really unstable and there was masses of big rocks and, and part of the building that were all on the ground. So there was a person there who said, look, I can get a ladder. And it went up the first time, and unfortunately the ladder was too short. And there's no way that I could could reach it in the window. So um, uh, I spoke to her briefly and asked her if there was anyone else that was in there with her, and, and she was quite coherent. She was obviously in shock, and she said there wasn't, and, uh, and she couldn't hear anybody, which was a good sign. Um, and I asked her if she was injured, and, and she said she thought he had a, she had a broken arm, and um, but she was relatively calm. Paul reluctantly steps down as they look for another option to reach Sue. Then someone finds a longer ladder, and Paul tries again. I felt this big push at my back, and the ladder, there was a big ladder that was being pushed through the window. Now, mind you, the whole time, the wall is just shaking. And at this stage, there was still the, you know, the aftershocks were going on, and um, so I wanted to get it down as quickly as I could, but also as safely as I could. So I got up to the ladder and got right up to it. Now there's a, there's a small window, and there's another one beside it. So we pulled it right back and, and broke it free, so the glass was all free for her to come out. But because she was in such a state of shock, it, it was very hard for me to get her to, she was facing out the window, it was very hard to get her to turn around and come down backwards. And after a couple of minutes, I knew that it was just not gonna work. So I, I asked her to move aside, so I climbed up into the building. He got me standing up on this little window seat. And at that point, I realized that my arm was broken because I had no power in it. It didn't hurt, but I couldn't do anything with it. I managed to turn Sue around, taking care of her arm as well, because her arm was completely uh, floppy and she couldn't hold on to anything. And he took my legs and he put one out the window onto the ladder and the other one out. And someone was below me who was actually taking and holding my feet and guiding them down. There was another guy that came up from the ladder and, and steadied it down. And I held on with one hand and my arm just sort of flopped down on the rungs of the ladder. And we eventually got out. And I got to the bottom and there were three or four men down there who helped me over all the debris that was there and took me out to a, a corner where there was a grassy spot far away from the cathedral. I remember Peter Beck came up to me. He's the dean of the cathedral, who will later go on to become a Christchurch city councillor. He said, you're alive, you're alive. And indeed, I was alive, and I was really thankful, and I was really thankful to be out of that little room. Uh, at that stage, there was a woman who was uh, being extracted from the cathedral. Stephen Mark, who's been treating injured people in Cathedral Square. I helped her coming down because she had a, a sore leg and a sore arm and needed some support and assistance uh, with getting her out and across the rubble. And then there's talk that she might not have been the only one in the building. There was a group of people who'd just come out of the cathedral uh, who were uh, very adamant that there was others in the cathedral and there was a period of time where there was some uh, attempt to uh, keep people far enough away from what was the rubble, but a realisation that there may have been people still inside. And so he makes the decision to go inside the damaged cathedral about um, 45 minutes to an hour after the earthquake, purely because we accepted that there may 
be a risk to that, but at least if we went in and had a look around, if there were people in there who were trapped or uh, injured, that we weren't going to just leave them there until such a time as it became uh, safe to go in, because that may be a prolonged period of time. So two of us went in and spent probably no more than two minutes wandering through the cathedral, climbing over the rubble, and just making sure there was actually nobody that was at either alive or trapped or uh, in any way needed rescue. So it was fairly obvious. Firstly, there was no sign of life. And secondly, there were no people who were obviously trapped. So we came back out of there. And uh, at that stage, myself and two of my other colleagues asked one of the policemen what was an opportunity to, uh, to help. And the aftershocks keep coming, and police become concerned about all the people gathered in the square. A call is made to evacuate the area. Paul Martin. It still took time because everyone was coming into the square. We kept them away from the cathedral. And then uh, once uh, there was a lot of people in there, and then they decided that Hadley Park was where people were going to go. So we managed to tell everybody that. It was about 10 minutes later, so then I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to get out of here and try and check on my family. The moment the word got out, people went all directions. Robin McCarthy. He initially plans to leave his work cars in the square so they don't clog up the traffic. But once the area's been evacuated, he changes his mind. He's just driving up to the corner of Colombo Street. And at that point, there was a big bang on my back window. And I stopped and someone came round to my driver's window and said, we need you as an ambulance. Before they picked me up and put me in the car, all these doctors just seemed to appear out of the woodwork because there was a, a conference of doctors in Christchurch. And so I guess they figured that I was all right to pick up and put in the car. So the, the, this man had put the seat down in the back of his station wagon and I was able to lie there. Fortunately, it was a station wagon. I put the back of the uh, rear seats forward and I so happened to take the woman who was silhouetted in the uh, window of the cathedral. Me and Dan kept walking around the city and then he just said, I need to find internet, I need to get, get this video up. Olivia Carvel heads back to where the other press reporters have gathered, near their building. Some are heading home, but the editor asks a senior reporter if he can go out and talk to people. Olivia finds herself agreeing to join him. And the last thing the editor said to us was, stay together, don't lose one another, walk in the middle of the streets and meet me back here in an hour. He was quite clear as to that he wanted us to come back and stay safe. So we didn't really know where to go and we were walking around and looking down the side streets and you'd just see small huddles of people around a seriously injured person or around a body. Clearly, I don't know, I don't really know what they were doing, but just small groups of people. There were no more people in the city centre. People are now being told to head for Latimer Square as more and more aftershocks shake the city. So, you know, you'd hit an aftershock and you'd stand in the middle of the street and building facades would just fall right next to you. And then we came to one corner of Manchester Street and High Street and the building had pancaked and you could see just normal people, normal people in bike helmets and running gear, businessmen in suits up in this rubble just hurling bits of, bits of building just to the ground, just searching to see if there's anyone there, you know, just yelling, is anyone in there, is anyone in there, just, I don't know, looking for any sign of life. And there was a man there watching, and I went over to him, and I said, you know, are you okay, did you used to live here? And he said, no, my brother does. And I was like, is your brother okay? And he said, I don't know. And I was like, where is your brother? He said, he's in there. And me and the other reporter were standing watching this and then a man in a high-vis vest, I think it was a policeman, came over and said, you're from the press, aren't you? And I remember thinking, he's going to tell us to move on, which is fair enough. And I said, yeah, we are from the press. And he said, do you mind moving because that building you're standing beneath is about to come down. And I looked up and the whole, the whole facade was hanging. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, I'll move. <laughs> 
During this same time, Stephen Mark and two urologist colleagues have been all over town, including the CTV building and Latimer Square. They've been travelling in the back of a police ute, helping to check buildings for anyone who might be hurt. We were calling out, we were stopping, we were going in and out of doorways. There was a smell of gas and there was a lot of buildings that looked really in a very disrupted state and that's why looking now at what amount of buildings has come down, I'm not surprised there's a large number that are down. And then they're told that there are people still trapped in the press building. There had been a significant aftershock and they'd taken some of the rescue people off the top of the building because of the risk of that collapsing. It's about 3 or 4.30 in the afternoon. Stephen goes with policemen to help get equipment, hammers and concrete cutters from a builder's container and fire officers and search and rescue teams into the building. And I volunteered to go up being a medical person to make sure that the people they were looking at digging out were actually going to survive if they needed any assistance. In getting there, there were two fluorescent crosses on the uh, ceiling floor uh, under your feet where you could talk to people directly underneath who were trapped and another woman who they could speak to but was further away um, and then there was a fourth person recognised as missing but they had no idea where that person was. She eventually turned out to have died uh, on the top floor probably at the time of the original earthquake because the top floor roof collapsed onto the third floor. Um, that trapped two of the secretarial staff and one of the others was trapped in a stairway and she eventually got walked out by an urban search and rescue person who went over the back um, through the rubble down one floor, came in from below and walked up and found her and she was able to walk back out and got lifted down. Uh, up on the roof you could climb underneath the floor level to a point where you could touch the legs of both of the women who were trapped but you couldn't do any more than that because their desks had collapsed around them and they were collapsed around chairs and they were really in a very tight position. I went over the bridge, had a bump on the other side, because most of the bridges I found out later on had moved in some way or another, or the land relative to the bridge. Robin McCarthy is carefully making his way towards the hospital. I turned south down Durham Street south, got to the intersection of Cashel Street, and a policeman stopped me. He said, you can't go down there, and he was rather angry. But I said, I've got a, I'm an ambulance, sir. And he looked in the back, and he says, wait there. And within probably two minutes, a police car arrived from probably out of the back of the police station itself. He said, follow that car. I then realised that there were two vehicles in front of me which were also acting as ambulances. Olivia Carville is still wandering through the broken city, speaking to whoever she comes across. But it was madness, you know. We were we were just traipsing through liquefaction and water, and sirens were everywhere. Helicopters were flying above, and um, I actually saw some policemen crying, and that really struck a chord with me. I kind of realised how bad it was to see policemen in tears. And then we came to Latimer Square, which is where they were gathering everyone, and there were just injured people everywhere, bandages around their heads. Some weren't moving. Some were covered in blood. Some had, I don't know, medical people were trying to assess them, but of course the hospital was just probably packed. Robin is one of many trying to reach the hospital. He finally makes it and can leave Sue in safe hands. Once there, she meets a friend who tries to track down her husband. She finally got in touch with him at about half past four at home, and he didn't know what had happened to me. And... Um, he had heard that the cathedral tower had come down and my daughter was there and they were all pretty upset. Back in Cathedral Square at the press building, Stephen Mark's still trying to help free two secretarial staff trapped by their desks which have collapsed around them. And it was a bit like a game of pick-up sticks where any stick you picked up on one side created more trouble on the other side. Uh, both were fully conscious and were able to communicate but were very uh, upset and were uh, in pain and both had fractures to their uh, body somewhere uh, but we couldn't recognise that at the time. So uh, both of them were then 
uh, attempted to be dug out in separate uh, events, one requiring the concrete cutter, which must have been rather a nasty noise underneath the roof, which would have been right close to your head, but it was through about four inches of concrete and steel. And um, one of the women was got out first, who was five months pregnant, had a shoulder and back fractures and was well trapped underneath, but she was slightly easier to get access to because that part of the roof had fractured. Every 10 minutes or so they stop and Stephen goes down to check on the trapped woman to make sure they're OK. The first person came out was with uh, a lot of assistance with strapping put underneath to pull them out sideways and bring them out and that she got out around about 6, 6.30. But it will take much longer for the second woman. She has compound fractures in both legs and the team aren't able to give her any form of sedation. So she was conscious and awake through the whole lot, but she was a very brave person, understood the situation, but she was making a lot of noise, complaining about being sore, but at the end of the day we knew that was actually something relatively positive because at least she was telling us she was sore and if she had got either gone unconscious or had uh, become more unwell, it would be obvious that she would start making less noise, so it was a good thing in the noise. Latimer Square is also full of injured people. Olivia Carville is there too, looking for someone official, anyone who might have the latest information. And I remember I found one person who looked like they were an authority or an official who could give me a comment and I just said, I know you're busy and I know you don't have time to talk to me, but can you just please tell me what's going on? What can I tell people right now in Christchurch? And he said, the only thing he said to me was multiple casualties. Tell the people that they're alone for the next 24 hours. And I was just kind of like, wow, okay, if he's saying that, I, I haven't grasped how big this situation really is. She and her deputy editor try to file what they've collected to the web with the one laptop they've got. And another aftershock hit and the buildings were just wobbling like jelly in Latimer Square. And my deputy editor said, "Can." Are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Can you write something? Yeah, I think I can. So he's like, come on then, we're going out to the printing press, which is out near John's Road, because he's heard that that building was safe. So he got, we got in the car, but the traffic was just unbelievable. I'm stuck in traffic, and then a very big aftershock came along. That was a 5.9. Tour operator Robin McCarthy. I was sitting there watching the hospital, it was going to whoop, 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 making a sound like that, and I thought it was going to fall over. Fortunately it didn't, but I could, I could also see the nurses home next door shaking quite violently, and I could hear things falling off the back of it, but I couldn't see anything. And of course that building's now subsequently been demolished. Police officer Paul Martin is still in the central city helping people, even while he tries to track down his own family. So I thought, well, there's no point me waiting in traffic. There's no way that I was going to get home. So I came back. I got a phone call from my brother-in-law to say that the kids were OK, but my wife was at the PGC building and I'd heard that that had collapsed. And on Cambridge Terrace, I thought, gee, I've got to go over there. And, you know, I didn't know whether she was all right. And so I started walking that way and uh, helping people on the way of whether to go. Olivia Carville is moving again too, but by car this time, her journey taking her to the printing press at John's Road, where the press journalists will be based for the coming months. And I got out there and they sat me down in front of a laptop and just said, write what you saw. I don't care what it sounds like, just write what you saw. And, you know, you don't usually get told that. <laughs> so I sat down and I remember I looked down and my dress was ripped. I was covered in dust and my, my shoes were covered in liquefaction and sewerage and I had blood all over me from Jane. And I just thought, what the hell has happened to my city? Others have also now left the devastation behind. I had to walk home to, <laughs> to Brighton from uh, how much no big deal for me because so much was going through your head. Blair finally making it home on his wife's 50th birthday, but reflecting on another wife's horrific experience in Cashel Moor. I found out later on that poor lady like me had to walk home alone, and uh, I thought, how, how terrible is that? It's later too that, while out on a work job, Blair understands why the man died. 
a lady was asking me where I was, and I told her I was in City Mall, and uh, she asked me what part. I said I was by the bakery, and uh, she said that that's where her best friend's husband died. And I said, he's not the one that... I said, there was something strange. She said, yeah, he's a hemophiliac. So that's why he would have, because I'm, and that would have been why the blood was so fun. So, uh, yeah, so it was about a 40 minute home, reflecting on what had happened in the mall. And uh, so that's basically my story of what happened. And for Olivia Carville, well, her story is all about the story, the one press readers will get the next morning, the one people will read online. And I looked at the cursor and it was blinking. And I was just like, I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know how I'm going to write about my day. So I just started it with the city of Christchurch looks like a war zone because that's how it felt to me. Um, and looking back... Um, it was, it was a nightmare of a day. I'm only a junior reporter, so I was literally thrown in the deep end. A nightmare that for Sue Spiegel ends when she reunites with her husband. He came in to the hospital and I guess it was about 4.30 or 5 and a nurse came in and checked my name and she said, your husband's out here. And I saw him. And that's the point where I broke down. Night begins to fall and at the press building, one of the secretaries is still pinned, weeched in by her collapsed desk and it's starting to rain. At that stage, I recognised we were going to have some trouble. We'd already got a number of the firemen had spent a long time uh, cutting through pillars. Uh, we had a crane lifting the beam up. There was a jack underneath the beam. There was the jaws of life. There were crowbars. And there was a number of items trying to shift the beams on top of her, and they were only just moving and no more. And on the basis of that, I recognise if we didn't get her out before it went dark, we probably would have real trouble getting her out. So at that stage, we'd organised for an anaesthetist and an orthopaedic surgeon to come up onto the roof just in case we needed them to assist with any form of amputation at the time because she didn't have any pain relief or sedation. But she came out and eventually has had both legs amputated, and I've visited her at hospital a number of times, and she remembers pretty much the whole lot and is still quite distressed by a lot of these events. The woman is taken away by ambulance. Stephen and the two visiting urologists finally leave to go find his car. Got home about 11 o'clock and had uh, some drinks first and then dinner and then uh, had a shaky night uh, without much sleep. And uh, then the next day all of the guests had to be flown out of New Zealand. So they all left without any of their passports or equipment, uh, any of their clothes and stuff, just in the gear they were in. It's late too by the time Jason Mitchell finally gets his charges out to Paparoa prison. I had four prisons I had to take to the men's and women's prison and I collected a vehicle and took them back to Central where they sat in, the, in a truck for about four hours. I couldn't get through to the prison to say, hey, we're bringing you some prisoners because their phones are out. And eventually I drove them out there and they were quite happy to go out there and get out of the city. And when that's done, he's told he'll be on duty for the next few weeks, helping to recover bodies from multiple sites around the city. Meanwhile, his fellow police officer, Paul Martin, is destined to keep helping others in the city centre. I walked past the PGC building and uh, I couldn't see Megan. That's my wife's name. And um, so then I carried on walking along Cambridge Terrace. I thought, well, I must have the wrong building. And I was picked up by another cop came along and goes, hey, look, we need to get a whole lot of this stuff barricaded off. It's been relentless too for Olivia Carville. I'd filed my story. I remember sitting in a chair waiting for someone to drop me home and the editor came in and I'd only been working at the press for a few months so I didn't really know him. And he came in and he came over to me and knelt down in front of me and just said, are you okay? And I nodded and then he said, tell me what you saw. And all I could say was, I saw dead people and he just started crying and then I just started crying and he just gave me a hug and he's just like, we'll get you home, you'll be okay. 
and that was a big moment for me for the editor to kind of show that human side to him I guess but now um, we've really been brought a lot closer every story we write is tainted by the earthquake um, everything we do is tainted by the earthquake but we're getting there and it's been a hell of a ride <laughs> and there are still aftershocks in the city but the overall experience for me as a journalist has been incredible and I've the stories I've been able to write you know I'll keep them forever Ten years on, Christchurch is a different place. Much of the city has been rebuilt, and while some people fled Christchurch, Stephen Mark is one of those who stayed and witnessed the changes. Yeah, I love Christchurch. I think it's uh, really been a process of evolution. We've all lived through the post-earthquake era where there has been destruction and rebuild and still some sites that are not filled, but there's been some amazing regrowth in the city. It's a revitalised centre of city and it's actually uh, lovely to see that uh, happen. Uh, I think Christchurch still holds a lot of positives. His strongest memories of the quake are clear in his mind, the difficulty of getting hold of people, and he also remembers some of the people he helped to free. Just seeing the faces of the people who were trapped and the vision of at least someone being there to help created a bit of that humanity and connection. Anniversaries can be tricky, but mostly Stephen tries to get on with his day and not think about February the 22nd. Being a doctor helps. I think that's a very fair observation, yeah. I, I think we do see things that a lot of other people uh, never get a chance to uh, observe and see and, and hopefully reflect and understand and, and help the situation. And uh, that was certainly one of the most unusual days in my life and one of the days that, on reflection, I'll always uh, have a, a deep recollection of and a deep sympathy for those who were uh, uh, caught up in the terrible situation. But I think having been involved in medically managing people, you do take that in your stride to a degree and, and recognise that there is a way of managing things and dealing with it. And uh, I think, you know, the whole of Christchurch has done remarkably well uh, given the scenario that was handed to us. Stephen feels for the builders, the contractors, who turned out to help and went above and beyond what was expected, but who probably didn't have the familiarity with crises that he and emergency services do. When he looks back at the day, there are little things that he might do differently, but not his overall approach. There's a basic medical principle Stephen tries to follow. If there's a problem and you have the skills to help fix it, then do so. Helping is why he agreed to be interviewed back in 2011. Spreading the uh, idea that most people have the ability to help out in these circumstances and uh, to do the right thing means that I, I think it's a, a, a good use of public education and discussion. So, you know, any time we can encourage people to uh, help out, uh, to do the right thing, uh, publicity and visibility of that I think is very useful. Um, I also think it's really quite a good thing to talk about these things and it helps you feel like you've uh, moved on and got over it and realise the time frame that has actually moved on since the event. The next time the conference attendees were together, they talked a lot about that day. But they also did more than just talk. A number of medals that were cast from the copper from some of the spoutings from post-earthquake that have been used every year to give to two members, uh, both internationally or nationally, who have done something above and beyond the call of duty to assist people, and they've been for lots of different things, uh, setting up hospitals in third world countries, uh, just providing something uh, for humanity that's above and beyond the call that's primarily related to the cancellation of the Christchurch Conference. And and as a strange quirk of events, uh, currently I'm the president of the Australasian Neurological Society and this year was directly involved in the decision to having to cancel the second meeting ever purely because of COVID arriving in Sydney the day before. So I was seemingly cast with the ability to be involved in cancelling our international meetings. One of those Christchurch medals for bravery belongs to Stephen. 
A lot of people were helped by the doctors who attended Stephen's conference and by all the other doctors, nurses, emergency teams and ordinary people who turned up to help. Stephen says thank you and he's thinking of the people they rescued. And the permanent damage they have and live with it long term and you just feel for them because their life is completely changed on the basis of that. So recognising those people who have a permanent disability or a loss and uh, really feeling for them. Sue Spiegel is also still living in Christchurch, but it took her a long time to come back from her experience. Well, for about the first two or three years, I spent a lot of time sitting in my rocking chair in front of the window looking out on Governor's Bay. Um, I wasn't motivated to do a lot. I felt a a bit shell-shocked and life pretty much, normal life just sort of stopped. And then one morning I woke up and I thought, I'm tired of being the woman in the window at the cathedral and I want to do something else with the time that I have left and so I never really went back to my the textile art that I was doing. I'm now just staying home most of the time enjoying my grandchildren who live next door and enjoying Governor's Bay which for me is heaven and um, being happy that I'm alive. Sue does volunteer work and gets on with living a good life. The Quaker's still with her, though, in subtle and not-so-subtle ways. I have seemed to have developed some health problems that I put down to the Quake because my parents never seem to have any of the sort of problems that I have, and I seem to be ageing faster, possibly than my friends. So that's causing me a bit of grief. But other than that, um, I live a, a quiet life and I'm just so thrilled to have an ordinary day with nothing going wrong in it. Her claustrophobia has got worse. I was always tended to be a little claustrophobic, but um, since then, and thinking about being in that little stairwell, That will actually bring on almost an anxiety attack to think about being in there if the shaking had started. That has really stuck with me. We showed Sue a snippet of her original interview. Her response to it was telling. I look at her and I feel very sorry that she had to go through that. but I know that she's okay. But you know, now that it's, it's over and I've been through it and I've, I've, I've integrated it into my self, I wouldn't give the experience up. I wouldn't want to go through it again intentionally, but I wouldn't want to give it up. Um, The fact that I did get through it, and I wasn't badly injured, uh, has given me another dimension to life and perception about how things are, and has developed me more as a person and opened me up to things that I probably never would have seen or experienced before. So it's part of me and, um, yeah, it's mine. And others too will be irrevocably changed by that day a decade ago. And I just thought, no, and something just told me to get out. And I just see this big pool of smoke over the city and I just thought, God, that's CTV building. She came along and she said, is my mother in there? Is my mother in there? Unlike September 4, where we kind of got away with it, we weren't going to be as lucky this time.
Those stories from the CTV building are next time on Fragments, first-hand accounts of the February 2011 earthquake. Fragments is written and presented by me, Katie Gossett, and co-produced by myself and Justin Gregory. It's engineered by Alex Harmer and Rangi Powick, and Tim Watkin is the executive producer of podcasts and series. Thanks to Julie Hutton and Sandra Close for their work in recording interviews, and to Nate McKinnon for additional recording and video work. We'd also like to thank Blair, Olivia Carville, Sue Spiegel, Robin McCarthy, Paul Martin and Jason Mitchell for sharing their personal stories to create this record of the fatal Christchurch earthquake on February the 22nd, 2011.